All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jason Flame, and welcome to the Monday edition of Master Vot Motivation with our guest today, Master Mike Chat. How you doing, Mr. Chat? Great. How are you? Thanks for I having am, me. I'm awesome. I'm super excited to have you. I've been looking forward to this one for several weeks now, and uh, I always like to start off with reminding everybody why I'm doing this video and, and what this is all about. So going into 2000, uh, to, 2021, I was setting my goals and I wanted to think about something that I could do that would really make a difference. And I looked back and remembered all the people that have motivated me, inspired me, excited me, not only about my martial arts school, but just in, in life in general. And you are definitely one of those people that came up top in the list. So I'm super excited to have you today to share your story, uh, just kind of chat, <laughs> if you will. And um, I'm going to start with just the story of how we first met and it was at the martial arts super show a number of years ago we had met in passing and talked a couple times but one thing that really stuck in my mind it was after one of the seminars uh, i ended up boarding my flight we're coming back to burbank and i go to sit down and here you are and i don't know if you remember this but we probably talked the entire time you're probably sick of hearing of me, but we talked the entire time from the time that the plane took off till we got back home. We had some great conversation. And ever since then, I've really enjoyed uh, talking with you and watching all the great things that you're doing. So um, let's start with your your story. I mean, where where did it all begin? Talk about your childhood. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, no, thinking back to that to that moment in, in which we met at that show and then and then getting caught up, you know, it's actually very rare uh, that that I would carry a conversation on a flight. If if you ever did see me, I've got my head down and uh, I try not to make eye contact. A lot of the things that I do at those shows is so public that you don't really get a moment to yourself. And then you get on the plane. That's kind of where I meditate. And so uh, and so we connected right away from the very beginning, uh, and that was very very cool. Um, but, uh, you know, my life is all about martial arts and, uh, I, I started, you know, very young when I was eight years old, not the youngest, but started when I was eight. Uh, I, I got into martial arts, you know, through loving Kung Fu Hong Kong style films. Finally, when I was eight, uh, I was able to start training. Uh, my parents thought it was too dangerous before that age. And so I grew up watching these voice dub TV, you know, shows and, and Kung Fu films and, you know, then started competing, you know, did very well, worked very hard for many years, and I became the top junior competitor and then won my seven titles as an adult, went on to do TV and film, film work, uh, most notably in the Power Rangers series as the Blue Ranger. Um, you know, lots of stuff that, you know, you might want to dive into later, but just to keep it brief, then, you know, one of my mentors, Grandmaster Clark, told me when I was still competing, coaching my teams, developing the XMA program, he said, well, you know, if you really want to help the industry, you know, once you stop competing, uh, you will understand what it means to truly dedicate yourself to others as a teacher. And I thought to myself, yeah, but, but I'm already teaching. I've done that since I was 12 years old. He said, no, but there's a large portion of what you do that is very selfish. And he didn't mean this in the bad way. He meant that as a competitor, you have to be selfish and aggressive in pursuing your dreams and goals. So the focus was all on me in developing me and partially on my students. You know, in my mind, I, I was thinking, no, but when I'm with my students, it's all about them. But as a martial arts instructor, for those of you who know, or you're a school owner, you know, when you're not trying to compete yourself, when you're not trying to get ahead yourself uh, as a martial artist, and all of that energy and that motivation and inspiration is funneled into what you do as an instructor for your students, it's a totally different ballgame. And so my life did really change when I stopped competing and all of my focus turned towards teaching students, eventually opening up the XMA World Headquarters and then, you know, having my own facility to do that in, not just the XMA program. So, uh, you know, that was, that was a major, you know, shift for me. And, and I'm glad I did it. So ever since, it's been about supporting others, whether it be competitors, uh, other martial artists, martial arts school owners, business owners, instructors, and organizations. So uh, that's it. I'm still doing that to this day. Uh, I'll always do that. I, I've, I've moved on to some other entertainment industry projects, but uh, uh, I'm a teacher 
at heart and I'll always teach. So um, I'm always excited about that. And you've had a tremendous impact on the industry as a whole. And I think that you will always be known, you know, in your bio, the very first line says that you're known as the Tony Hawk of martial arts. I mean, that's a pretty big statement um, with with what you started with XMA. And we'll get into that in just a second. But let's go right back to the beginning again. You trained with Sensei Sharky. Um, you're from initially Chicago? Yes, the Naperville uh, uh, suburb. And so not, not the inner city, but I did compete in the inner city as a kid. So I grew up in Naperville, born in Thailand. And uh, that was it. That was my childhood up until I graduated from high school and then moved out to Northern California. And what was it that, that um, you know, you competed a lot at, at an early age, you know, and before you came out here, I, I, I can remember watching you compete um, in the days that it was, it was you and John Valera and Richard Brandon were kind of some of the top names that come to my head right away. Yeah. Um, always loved watching you guys perform. What was it that sparked your interest in competition in general? So it was... It was a natural progression because of the, the martial arts school that I, I started at. So my very first martial arts school, they were a competitive school. They promoted a tournament. It, it wound up closing down about a year, not even a year after I joined. And then my, my current instructor, Sensei Sharky uh, of Sharky's Karate, he took over that school and he was a big tournament promoter um, back then and is still today with the AK Warrior Cup tournament in Chicago. So it was just, I didn't know any different. So my dreams to become, you know, a Hollywood martial arts actor, you know, was the end goal. But all I knew was that martial arts and competing went hand in hand. I didn't know that you could do martial arts without competing. I thought that was normal. It's just like if you're going to play soccer, you play in a team and you have games on the weekends, right? Or basketball, baseball. And so as a kid, you don't know any different. It just so happened that I fell into a competitive school which uh, was very fortunate for me. I was very lucky and it, it really helped to hone my skills and develop me as a, you know, as a martial artist competitor and, uh, and really helped to build my brand eventually. And, and your, your brand became the extreme martial arts XMA and, and yeah. you've trained um, countless number. I mean, we, we could probably rattle off a few names that lots of people would know from, from the movies now and, and in the past. Um, yeah. You know, Taylor Lautner was one of the, the first ones with, with Shark Boy and Matt Mullins and uh, Craig Henningsen were, were some of the, the top names that I remember earlier on. And then, of course, a little later, we have Caitlin Deschel, who is in uh, Wonder Woman and, uh, and, and and your boys. Your boys are training and, and starting to do a lot of stuff. Yes. Uh, you know, th there are some big names, which is, you know, I've just been very fortunate. I mean, you know, Taylor Lautner came from the tournament circuit, helped him get his start here in Hollywood. You know, his family lived with me for his first like month and a half, almost two months of his first pilot season just to get started. Um, but then you have like uh, Ryan Pinkston, who he was a tournament competitor, uh, came from Charlie Lee's karate and helped him get his start here in Hollywood. And he wound up becoming the, the kid on uh, the show Punked with Ashton Kutcher that would punk the celebrities uh, on the red carpets. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then it's like, well, what happened to him? Well, he's you know, he's working on different shows now. You know, he went through a transition from childhood to uh, an adult career, but you know, he's still very active in the entertainment community. You know, people remember Taylor and Jaden Smith and, you know, but like prepping uh, Army Hammer for, um, for Pacific Rim and, uh, uh, and um, uh, oh my gosh, uh, Charlie Hunnam for Pacific Rim. Then, you know, prep, prepping him, you know, on some sword work along with one of my students, John Nania, who, you know, John Nania, he, he was the, the 14 to 16 year old sword kid, you know, that was up and coming. And he really just kind of, he didn't even really compete as an adult competitor, came to Hollywood, wound up doubling Keanu Reeves on 47 Ronin. And then uh, he got a bunch of calls, had to turn down multiple times, doubling Keanu for Matrix 4 because he was already doubling the Winter Soldier on Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which is out now, it just came out on Friday. And, uh, and he's currently doubling Chris Evans on the new Netflix, uh, the gray man film. So, you know, ah, I mean, whether it's Marvel or DC characters from daredevil, Iron Man, Thor, Captain America, um, even like 
the Black Panther, Killmonger, Doubles, they, they were not students of mine, but like Anish Sherfa, Daniel Graham, they're XMA tricking champions um, you know, from back in the day. They've gone on to have incredible careers. It, it's really amazing because of the style of action that is now in TV and film that really was kickstarted from the Matrix trilogy. You know, it's just been in high demand ever since, and even so more now with Marvel and DC projects. Now, when you moved from Naperville here to uh, to Hollywood, to California, was that your intention? Is that that's what you wanted? You wanted to get involved in in that industry in Hollywood? Absolutely. So uh, I took a little detour because I wound up in Northern California as a competitor. I connected with Larry Lamb, who is one of the original Mutant Ninja Turtles, but now has become a huge second unit stunt coordinator, second unit director. Um, like you know, he was the Canadian coordinator on Deadpool. And uh, he was a coordinator on Altered Carbon season one, um, you know, really made an incredible name for himself. But he had a school in Los Gatos, California. So I started off in San Jose, San Jose State, teaching for him uh, full time while going to school. And then eventually after booking WMAC Masters and Mortal Kombat, I wound up moving down to, to Los Angeles and transferring to UCLA. And, and so as you were going to UCLA, um, what, what were your was it still the aspiration? Hollywood movies, or did you have another avenue that you were looking at while you were at UCLA? No, it was it was it was all it was all based on uh, TV and film. And so, what I did was basically I had my backup plan. The backup plan was business school, so it was either Berkeley or UCLA. So I wound up uh, I was on a direct transfer agreement to both. Um, you know, a, a year at San Jose State, and then I transferred to the junior college system, which is it's easier. Uh, a little bit more conducive for transfers um, from from junior colleges to universities. So then I had my choice. I could either go to Berkeley or UCLA. And because I had just finished WMEC Masters, I decided to uh, to make the move to Hollywood. So um, business econ was my major and and my backup. But you know, really, it was all about the entertainment work. So it was second. Um, the second time I got the call, I did some doubling on Mortal Kombat Conquest uh, for Kung Lao, the lead Asian character. When they called me back and I had to take like two months off, three months off for filming, uh, I needed to decide whether or not to take the job or, or stay in school. So I deferred school, took the job, um, and I'm, I'm still two quarters shy of finishing at UCLA. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Still yeah. a possibility, though. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I can. Uh, they'll redo my credit hours and reconfigure what I have to finish. But, uh, you know, it just it just became less of a priority the more I started to work and pursue my career. So um, when did the XMA headquarters, when did the whole thought, idea kind of formulate that you were going to open this school? Um, I always wanted to have my, ho my own school. Um, but we were uh, in New York City for a brief moment. Uh, my ex-wife at the time had booked a soap opera and, and we were living there. And upon deciding to return to Los Angeles once, once she finished, then you know, it really was about catering to the times and the idea of you know, creating a, a training facility that incorporated truly what we did in XMA when it came to not just the forms and weapons for tournament competition, but to prepare actors, performers, some professionals to prepare them for TV and film. So then that covered everything from precision, solo performance, to the weapons choreography, to you know trampoline, acrobatics, mini tramp, to the wire work, and then fight choreography. So we just, uh, you know, I knew I wanted to combine them all under one roof and uh, de decided to just reach out to all my you know, stun buddies to consult with them and figure out the best way to do it. And then we executed. I think I remember the, I don't know if it was a grand opening or just a party again, you know, Maya had a, yeah. had a, a, a field trip, if you will. And, yeah. and we all got to, we all got to play. I mean, one of the most beautiful facilities uh, that I've, I, I've been in and you had it all. I mean, you had the, the, the tramp, you had the, all the silks, you had the, huge mat and and also the area where everybody could put together their highlight reels you had the whole computer stations for everybody it was just it was such an awesome place and such a a great idea for people to go and do you know 
all, all, all in one. I mean, they could just come in and, and do um, everything that it needed to help get them to that next level. Mm-hmm. And um, we were fortunate to bring our, our students down there. I still have pictures of my son with you at like, I don't know, he must have been four or five years old. It <laughs> comes up in the memories every now and again. It's a good one. Yeah. It's a really good one. So now, you know, you kind of transition to away from being uh, a full-time school owner and started per- pursuing some other things. So let's talk about that. Um, so after, after running, uh, the headquarters for 10 years, um, six years in, I decided to bring on a partner. That was the smartest thing I ever did, but it was, uh, it wasn't of my, you know, it wasn't of my own doing. I was very naive, uh, should have listened to the advice of all of the consultants. So if any of you are working with a consultant like Master Flame or any of the other Maya Lee consultants, and you, you should you should really you should really pay attention. Uh, I was young, stubborn, and wanted to do things my way, uh, learn the hard way. And the business was very inconsistent. We had amazing months, we had terrible months. It was up and down, and it was a massive facility and undertaking. We invested a lot. It was it was tricky, uh, an amazing learning experience. It was incredible for the uh, for the members, but it was it was definitely a learning experience. So. I partnered with Chief Master Von Schmeling from the ATA and Victory Martial Arts. He came in and helped to implement some real structure into the curriculum when it comes to the base martial art curriculum. And then, you know, we we combined forces in creating what is now known today as the Victory or the ATA Leadership Program. We took the XMA Extreme Martial Art moves and we combined them with the, the life skills, his his uh, Victory School of Life life skills, and we created the the uh, new leadership program. So. It was a much better way to go, much better way to uh, deliver the material because instead of just bombarding people all at once with all of this high level material, there was there was options. And we would often get calls, hey, do you just teach basic martial arts? And we're like, yeah, of course. And they're like, no, 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 we know you guys train the professionals. We just need like a basic program for kids. And although we did that, our, our messaging, our branding was totally confusing. So uh, it was a great learning lesson. Um, and then we decided at, at, um, at year nine and a half or so, you know, we started to groom Ms. Davis, our program director and taking over the business. She wanted to open up her own location. And that's actually what happened. We wound up so selling the location. We helped to move it into Sherman Oaks. And then she wound up taking it over under the victory martial arts name. And that freed up my time. So this way I could focus more on entertainment projects. So, uh, that was, that was, a four, three and a half, four year uh, transition where I consciously decided that I was going to stop traveling, stop doing seminars so much internationally, really focus on getting back into the entertainment industry. I wanted to do some action directing and producing, had some ideas about projects. People had some good script ideas that wanted to get their projects off the ground. So, uh, you know, that, that truly is my skill set, and, um, you know, wanted to give acting another stab. But what I realized was, you know, in this whole transition, you know, I've, I've always been one to take on many projects and I, know, I knew I needed to really consolidate and just really streamline my focus. So, you know, very quickly, I realized that, uh, you know, being out of the business for, for 15 years, pretty much, um, you know, left a lot of holes, gaps in my resume as an actor, experience on set. You know, if, if I did want to pursue stunt coordinating, which is not the direction uh, that I'm going and, uh, so I decided to really just hone that in. Um, the acting side dropped off, you know, focusing on action directing started to drop off. And I'm, I've really decided to just focus my energies on producing. I've got, I've got one project that um, it's in development um, with a big director right now. And uh, uh, David Leach with 87 North, you know him from Deadpool 2 and Hobbs and Shaw and, uh, and, and the new film Bullet Train. But um, you got a couple other uh, really good projects that, that are in the works right now that we're developing and, and starting to pitch. So that's very exciting. And it utilizes my skill set and the connections that I've established over the last 25 years in the industry and pulling them all together. So, you know, in doing this, my goal is still to then have a platform to then bring more widespread exposure to the martial arts industry. And that's what I intend to do in the future when I have more control over certain projects is to be able to create some really great programming that will help boost martial arts, motivation for it, inspire people and get more people training. So that way they can then, 
you know, receive the exact same benefits I did, you did, our students uh, have, you know, through their martial arts training and their journey. Well, talking about skill sets, I mean, you have a, a wide variety of skills, you know, from the uh, extreme martial arts, training traditional martial arts, teaching martial arts. Uh, you were involved um, and still, I believe, in, in being a commentator mm -hmm. for, for sport, mar sport martial arts. So talk a little bit about how that came about, maybe kind of take us back to the to early days of, of doing that and how it's changed since then. Yeah, so it was a natural progression, uh, although it, it had never been done. Um, many things were a first as I was coming up uh, through the ranks as a competitor, transitioning uh, from competitor to just a team coach and then martial art curriculum developer. Then, you know, I was the one that helped uh, Charlie Lee, who ran uh, a tournament out of out of Virginia. Um, he was one, one of my forms mentors as, as a kid. He became a tournament promoter. I didn't want to become a tournament promoter, but I helped him write the rules for NASCA, the first organization, the North American Sport Karate Association, to then implement a division between traditional and musical forms. So it used to be creative and musical forms or open forms, as we called it, the American Open Division, which is basically do whatever you want, right? You either had a traditional form, traditional weapons form, or do whatever you want. And then there was a do whatever you want with music division, right? That was it. So then you had traditional martial artists competing against people who were just starting to do more acrobatic kicks. You know, they maybe threw an aerial or a backflip, some more flashy moves, but you know, it was just starting. So I was transitioning out of competing, tricking became more of a thing. Uh, you know, the, ESP, the ESPN commentator, uh, producer, and the US Open promoters, they wanted to have somebody, somebody who could talk about what was going on in the creative and extreme division and understand what the moves were, the terminology, and could explain it because they were watching it evolve, but they didn't understand it as much. So that's where I came in. You know, I was the one who was retired, still involved in the tournament circuit and, and, and active. So I just became that guy. And, uh, you know, they liked me. It worked out well. I enjoyed it. Um, and I could really use that as a platform to educate the audience on, well, what is the difference between creative and extreme, right? What is the minimum between, you, you know, uh, sticking to a 360 rotation on a move, not inverting in creative versus doing more than a 360 rotation, let's say for a 540 or a 720 and, and inverting, right? Because a, a, a wushu butterfly kick, you're not inverting. Neither, if you do it correctly, you're not inverting on a wushu butterfly twist either. Right. And so technically a wushu butterfly twist, you know, could have been in the creative division. We deemed that more extreme because of the acrobatic, you know, requirement. But there are little things like that where, you know, the audience needed to be educated and as well as the tournament uh, competitors and judges because it was all new. So for the first time in history, there was this extreme forms division. The creative open division had a new set of rules. Right. And same with with musical. Then we implemented Team Sync and team demonstration. And so, you know, I was there at the beginning where we helped to then push these divisions and then they became actual division categories with world title, you know, competition for ESPN at the US Open. And then it just became the standard. So, you know, from NASCA, the NBL, the WKC, WKA, uh, you know, all these different organizations decided to then adopt extreme forms and weapons because it just made sense. They didn't want traditional people trying to compete against people that were doing flips and tricks. And, you know, they didn't really understand it anyway. So, uh, yeah, uh, 18 years later, we're looking forward to the next one. <laughs> right, right. And you're, and you're still commentating. You're still. Uh, yes, yes. So um, we, you know, we're, we're planning to do the next one. But, but as you know, the, the 2020 U.S. Open got postponed. It is technically on for July, but we'll see if it gets pushed again. As of right now, it's uh, it's scheduled for the beginning of July. Sounds good. Sounds good. I, I always love watching it, and I and then I I hear your voice, and I'm like, it's just tying it all together. It's just so cool to see that. Um, again, another skill set. You've taught seminars all over the world, the, all over the world, uh, you know, spreading extreme martial arts, but, but more than that, it's, it's the 
attitude that comes along with it. And, you know, the theme of the show is, is motivation. Um, you know, what kind of motivated you and inspired you to get out there and just speak all, you know, all over the world. You spoke at the, the super show almost every year that I can remember. Um, you, you've gotten up and, and just spoken about it and, and guest teaching. Talk a little bit about that and your experience with that. Um, well, in the beginning, like like any te- well, maybe not like any teacher, I guess when I think about it, I remember very clearly I was asked, you know, I wasn't pursuing it. I wasn't trying to say, hey, I've got this knowledge and skill. Let me teach at your event. Uh, I was just happy to be invited to perform at the event, right? I wasn't thinking, oh, and do a seminar. So all of that came from uh, another one of my mentors. I have many, uh, Jean Frenette, uh, a, an amazing forms champion uh, from back in the 80s. He used to compete with John Chung, George Chung, Charlie Lee, uh, Keith Herbayashi, Javon Holmes, uh, all of these old school guys. And Jean Frenette was one of the best. Um, you know, I loved his musical forms. He's, he became very famous in Europe. And then he said he invited me to go, then go do a tour in Italy where I was performing at 15 years old on a 12 city tour. So after that tour, um, I did a good job apparently. So then he said, okay, the next step is you need to win your world title. And then, you know, I'm going to connect you with this magazine promoter in Germany who owns all these magazines in Europe. And then you can go do seminars and teach and make money. So that's where, you know, the idea came from for me, but he really had a structure for doing it. And uh, he, he really was the king of doing these international seminars, um, you know, and, you know, really doing well, providing great value to an audience and demographic of people that couldn't get the training anywhere else. And, you know, really merchandising like crazy. So from, you know, photos to videos to shirts and hats. And I mean, he did it all. And this was back in the 80s. So um, for me, it was about, oh, you'd like me to teach after this event? I would love to teach, right? And so it started like that. And then, it, you know, once I did a couple of them, then, you know, I, I was mentored. Uh, everybody should have good mentors. And so then, then I turned it into a business and it, and it really did help me, um, you know, until I opened a school, you know, that became the way that I was able to teach, help other people expose my version of the martial arts, um, you know, to an audience where, you know, there was a, there was a demand and, and I could do it without just limiting myself to just one location and one, you know, set audience in a local environment, I could go and travel and do it all over the world. Yeah, that's that's excellent. I mean, that was a great story. You know, we all it's kind of like your first time teaching class. I don't know if it was like this for you, but, uh, you know, I wasn't really dying to teach, but it was literally on the night that I earned my black belt that my instructor says, here you go, teach class. And it, it's like, whoa. <laughs> and you just kind of go from there and you, I'm sure uh, learn by making a lot of mistakes, learn by um, just experience in general, and 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 you've become known as as one of the top instructors at seminars, one of the most sought after. You know, I I can remember just the, the room being packed at, at the Super Show, people that just wanted to come in and listen, just wanted to hear, just wanted to experience um, the energy from Mike Chat. You I know, want to just share. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I just want to share this question before I forget and it scrolls down. But uh, Dane, who is actually a, a student of mine, he he wants to know what would be the best tip you could give on the commentating side. Um, he announces motocross and high school football and baseball. He's always looking to be better. So what's what's one of your tips uh, to be a better commentator? So what uh, actually most people, most people who enjoy sports and like to talk about sports could really make a great commentator. They just don't think they know what, they don't think they know what to say on camera. Or you, you put a camera in front of them and they're like, uh, and they kind of get tongue tied. Well, what is it that you like about what you're seeing? Right? What do you think is interesting? And when you think it, if you just say it, that's actually what a commentator does. Now, that's the basic level right? You see something, oh, check that out, right? That was cool. Talk about it. 
right? You see how he just did that, right? See, some martial artists spend years trying to develop that, but even from the last tournament, that's a new trick that Jackson Rudolph just threw in and like, you know, makes it look so easy, right? Then, then you talk about the things that you like, you talk about things that other people like, right? And then, and then the next level is, well, what are the, some, some of the things that people don't know, right? Like you would have to be an insider to know, like, I know that earlier today, re, let's say Reed Presley was practicing one of his release routines. And that was the one that he dropped on last year at this very same tournament, right? And then I might, I might see him nail it in competition on the US Open final stage and say, you know, I just saw him earlier today struggling a little bit with that. And he comes out and overcomes the hurdle from last year and he nailed it, right? Then that's interesting because other people wouldn't know or they wouldn't remember, right? So sometimes you look at the insider information of what you know about the person, you know their history, you know what might have happened that day, right? All of those things, because if someone turns on the TV and they've never seen your sport before, then you have to get them interested somehow. They don't know what they're looking at. I might, if I like, I don't know much about motocross, so I might just look at them, you know, jumping and they're airborne and they land and they keep going. And to me, it just looks normal, right? But as a commentator, you could give some insight into, well, what does it take, right? So you might lead in and say, you know, well, that might just look normal to some of you if you're just joining us. But, you know, even to do some of those little jumps, right, requires a tremendous amount of focus because, you know, you're coming off of a series of one, two, three little hills, and then you need to prepare for that turn right afterwards. You need to know what's coming down the line that gives us a frame of reference, right, of what we're looking at. So, so you should ha always have levels, right? The first level is the obvious. What are we looking at? The second level, you need to be more educated, give some history, you know, uh, give some insight, right? Some kind of insider tip, right? And then, and then that, that will really help to improve. But like anything, the more you know, the more you can draw from. And then it's about practicing when you're not live, but you're acting like you're live. <laughs> practicing is the most important because what you plan to say and what you actually say can be two totally different things. And that's where, that's where a lot of commentators live, they get tongue tied or they start saying the same things or repeating the same words and you don't wanna be saying the same things all the time, right? You don't wanna be using the same descriptive kind of uh, adjectives. I mean, I could go on, we could do a whole, a whole weekend <laughs> workshop on that. Here's, here's your workshop right here. You have always had the unique ability to, I, as you're talking about motocross and commentating, I'm, I feel myself drawn to the screen and drawn to your voice. Where did you develop that? How did you develop that to where you're, I mean, you're so engaging. Anybody that ever talks to you that for five minutes, you, you walk away going, wow, that guy's intense. And <laughs> intense in a good way. Intense in a good way. Yeah, it's funny. But where does that come from? You know, it's funny. You change your wording from engaging to intense. And I do, I do get intense more than engaging. And it's funny because my wife, when we first started dating, um, she used to say that all the time. She's like, you're really intense. Like, and it wasn't necessarily in a, you're welcome. Uh, it wasn't necessarily in a good way. Like it's overwhelming to some people. And, and um, what that is, is, you know, people say that like you come to Hollywood and they say, oh, that person, they just have that like it factor, that X factor, or that, that level of confidence that you cannot teach. And I, I, would, I would beg to differ. Um, I've taught it. You can develop people that are nobodies into somebodies, right? Everybody starts somewhere, but, but you develop, you develop skill first from developing skill, you develop confidence and self-esteem. What most people don't focus on is this other aspect. And when, when people talk about, you know, booking an audition or doing an audition or then getting in front of camera or just talking to people socially, right? Public speaking is one of the most feared activities among adults. So it's not just the confidence. You can have all the confidence in the world. You practice, you've got your speech down or you, you know, you're, you're very personal. And um, it's not about the confidence. It's really about 
being willing to take risks when you don't have the confidence, talking about things that you don't know how the other person is going to react. You don't know what the, uh, the audience is going to think. You don't know how they're going to take it, right? But you're so strong in your conviction that it doesn't matter, right? So for me, it's about a couple things. One, having strong conviction that comes through just living, experiencing, being, developing confidence over time, you know, having a high level of self-esteem, being knowledgeable, right? Because if you're not studied, if you're not educated on the subject matter, I mean, really educated, like, you know, people start talking about politics, especially here in Hollywood. And it's like, you can tell right away. It's like this person, they don't know what they're talking about. They're scratching the surface, but they don't really know the levels of what's going on or they know the history of the last year, right? Politically, but they, they don't know, well, what has transpired since the 20s, the 30s, the 60s, right? Then when you don't really know the history on a subject, you won't be as confident. You will not deliver with conviction, right? And so the areas that, that I am very strong in, you know, I can speak to and that's where I focus, you know, my, my, my time. And the, the other areas, I don't, I listen. So, you know, uh, Master Von Schmeling is, is very good about this. And, and he taught me this from the very beginning. And he, he said, I'm either a teacher or I'm, I'm a student. I'm teaching or I'm studying. That's it. That's how I approach my life. And, and you know, what was confusing to me when I first, you know, started to grapple with this concept is like, well, no, like there's other things you can be like, sometimes you just want to chill out and relax. And, you know, but when you're a teacher, right, you should always be teaching. Or if you're not teaching, and you're watching, you're learning. So when we're teaching, and we're watching our students, we're learning something from our students, even though we're teaching. But in that moment, we watch, ah, now we realize that, okay, now, if you want to enhance that, we need you to do this, well, we just learn something in order for us to be able to drop that wisdom. Is that right? And deliver that, that, that technical enhancement, whatever it may be. So, so for me, it's about, you know, I get that from people because I'm very passionate, you know, and I love what I do. So if you want to talk, if you want to discuss something, right. Um, that's interesting. Let's talk, right. I'll have lots to say. If you ask me questions, if you're not asking me questions, I'm going to be asking you questions because I want to learn. And, and that's just because that's my personality. Right. And so, you know, for me, I just started doing that much more because the more you learn about people, it's just more interesting, number one. And, um, you know, and then you're more knowledgeable and then you connect better, you develop, you know, deeper relationships. It's, it's good personally, it's good for business, all of that. Right. So that, that's why people feel that from me because, it doesn't matter if I'm teaching or not, because if I'm not teaching, I'm studying, right? I'm the student and I want to learn about you and what you're doing and what you have going on. And so, you know, that's, that's why, like, I'm truly interested. I think a lot of times people ask questions to ask, but they're not truly engaged. And for me, it's like, okay, and then what and why, but why did you do that? Okay. And that led to what? And then because of that, what, what happened and how did that affect you? And like, I'll just keep going because I want to know. I'm so interested in what, in, in the psychology of people, um, because that's how, that's how I help people is, is to understand the patterns of behavior that people have. I mean, you know, n uh, not unlike all of the other greats out there, you know, from Anthony Robbins to all the other speakers, like they're super studied. Uh, they're very engaged because they're truly interested and that's how they help people. Well, as I'm listening to you right now, I, I, I can just feel the conviction. I mean, any time I hear you speak, you speak with complete conviction and everything. I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes and I'm writing things down as you're talking right now as we speak. You know, one of the things that, that stood out that you said, too, is um, and it's something that I say to my students a lot is when you're watching somebody, you, you're going to learn one of two things. You're going to learn what to do or what not to do. Exactly. You know, and, and it's just such a, a great learning moment. And I think as, as martial artists, we get caught up in the teaching part so much that we're not receiving and taking things back in. So I just want you to know that I'm, I'm learning 
a lot right now just listening to you speak. And there's a lot of people jumping on here that I can see are, are really enjoying this with their comments. So I want to talk a little bit about struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that you mentioned um, in, in as, a, as a school owner, as someone that's at a, in a high profile situation, uh, talking about our first encounter on the on the plane, you know, sometimes you just want to turn off. Mm-hmm. How do, do you find that difficult to, to always be on? Do you find it difficult to to be able to sit back and pull yourself out of that spotlight for a minute? Um, for me, no, because um, I uh, in the beginning, no, let me let me rephrase in the beginning. No. And then I needed to schedule it. So because I loved it, I enjoyed it. I was young. I could go on two to four hours of sleep, which is not good. Sleep is not overrated. You need your sleep. Um, but I used to just go and, and, you know, do red eyes, fly internationally, land and teach and just go for two weeks straight and just go on fumes. And it didn't matter. I loved it. I had the energy. Um, that was very bad for my body. It was very bad. It was very bad for the people around me personally because I was tired, you know, when I wasn't working, um, you know, and and on all the time. And, you know, I always felt like I was behind and I wasn't. And I I, I couldn't enjoy the moments that I should have been able to enjoy, you know, and the successes that I was having because I was always on to the next a little bit too fast. Right. And uh, you know what that's like when you're building your school and you know, you're getting other clients and and you're building your businesses. Um, So you know what I'm talking about, but there's many school owners that that are in the process of building their business or they're looking at going to, you know, a a second, third location. And, uh, you know, it's not about having balance. uh, Like my partner says, Master Bunch Melling is about counterbalance, right? It's like when you walk, it's not about balancing, it's about counterbalancing. You're always, you're always like this, right? And so if you, if you look at a tightrope walker, right, what do they do? They're always, they're always like this with their arms out and they're, you know, they're, they're like this trying to, trying to do what? People say balance, but really what they're doing is they're counterbalancing. Is that right? The weight shifts one way, they got to go the other way, right? And that's really what life is like. At certain times, you're going to focus more on your school versus your family, more on your family versus your school or your, your personal life versus your business, whatever that may be. And, and really, it's about counterbalance and finding the moments where you need to be focused much more in one area and then you counter it with something else. OK, you did that for two weeks or two months. Now let's make sure and, and, and not ignore everything else. Right. And you find that counterbalance in there. And so I needed to schedule time. So, um, you know, to pull away, to, to relax, to unwind, to, um, you know, to really recenter, regroup. Uh, that was very, very healthy for me. Um, and and I mean, after like a 10 and after a 15 year period of just like burning it at both ends. So I don't recommend it. Uh, I, I had, uh, I had run my body into the ground mentally. I was exhausted. Uh, I went through a divorce um, that had a lot to do with the divorce, um, made a lot of mistakes, made a lot of mistakes. So um, I'm not talking in theory. I'm, ta- I'm talking from personal experience that, um, you know, finding that balance or counterbalance and really taking the necessary time. It's like you schedule your time to train your body, right? People will schedule their time to go to a personal trainer or They get their 30 minute or one hour workout in. You should schedule your time for your mental health, right? You need to schedule time to properly grocery shop so you can be eating the right and preparing the right foods, not eating out and grabbing stuff on the go all the time, right? So, um, yeah, another like we could we could do another weekend workshop on this. Uh, (laughs) We may have to schedule a couple more calls just to talk more about it. Yeah. But, but yeah, for sure. That's, it's a big one for me because, um, you know, everybody thinks they can just keep going and going, but uh, at some point something's got to give and you're not maximizing your efforts, like trying to do things all on your own, not having partners or mentors, um, you know, wanting to control it all yourself. Um, guilty of all of that. Uh, but I learned 
And um, luckily, I learned pretty quickly, I would say. Uh, I wish I would have learned it faster. But, uh, you know, once I brought on a partner, you know, and then really started to utilize the, you know, the mentors in my life from, you know, all of the Maya people, Mr. Silverman, Metzger, Mike Dillard, Sr., uh, David Wall at Century, uh, everyone, much more, much more. Um, you know, it was, it was a humbling experience uh, and necessary in my growth and evolution, but, but absolutely necessary. So, um, yeah, get, getting away and, and finding, you know, your own personal time to, to counterbalance everything that's going on is extremely important. Thanks for all of that. That's that's great information. And again, uh, Kevin Kowalczyk, you know, quoted you there, and that was the, the most powerful takeaway from listening today. Um, I want to ask you and get a little bit personal. What were some insecurities you had, maybe as a, a, a young child, young adult, that you have carried into your adult life, and how do you deal with it? Yeah. So um, if if you've been Watching the headlines now, more and more, you're seeing a lot of this, uh, you know, anti-Asian uh, protesting and the anti-Asian violence issues that are coming up now. You know, if you grew up during the time that I grew up, right back in the back in the '80s, you were bullied, you were picked on if you were Asian. Um, you know, if you were black, Latino, you know, and the minority in your school right in your town you were picked on you were segregated you were singled out uh in a negative way so you know that had a lot to do with you know my motivation so i was a bully when i was a kid but why because i was bullied obviously so the older bully kids in the neighborhood picked on me so what did i do i picked on other kids that were smaller weaker right same age or younger so it all trickles down but but why because of my fear, right? My fear of what? I was picked on because I was Asian. I was Chinese, right? And I got called every racial, racial slur in the book, right? And, um, you know, when one of the bullies had a friend one time, um, because I, I never really backed down, but neither did I really stick up for myself, right? So I just wouldn't say anything. When one of the when one of the bully's friends joked and said, "Oh, better watch out. He might know karate," right? <laughs> that stuck with me. I'm like, I better learn some of this stuff, right? So I kept pushing my parents to let me join, but they wouldn't let me join karate until I was eight years old. So then, then uh, always having that feeling of of what insecurity, insignificance, not having any kind of status, right? Um, being a minority. Then, uh, you know, there was, I don't know, a handful of Asians in my entire grade, let alone school, right? So growing up, so that was a huge motivation. And then uh, always feeling like I needed to prove myself. Well, you know, Asians were known to be smart. My sisters were valedictorian and salutatorian of their high school classes. They, they went on to, you know, University of Chicago and Northwestern and Stanford. And so, you know, it's like top tier schools. Here I am, the black sheep of the family getting B's. You know, I didn't graduate top 10 in my class. I graduated like number 524 or something like that. So uh, I was the black sheep of the family. So I always felt like I needed to prove myself, um, prove myself to my parents, prove myself to my family, prove myself to my neighborhood. Um, we had great supportive neighbors, but it was all about how smart my sisters were, right? So I felt like I had something to prove. Well, I could do that in martial arts. And so because, you know, people expected me to know martial arts because I was Asian, it fit. It's like, okay, I'm Asian. Do I know martial arts? Yes. Okay. That, then that made it cool. Oh, he's martial arts. He, he or, or he's Asian and he knows martial arts. That's cool. Right. Then watch out for him. So then, uh, you know, that driving force really was, well, I really better know how to fight because I'm getting older. I'm now in junior high going into high school kids might want to test me. I better know my stuff. Right. So that's why I always competed in sparring. I loved it. Even though I didn't continue on extensively as an adult competitor, like I always sparred forms, weapons, fighting, you know, uh, all throughout my competitive career, even until I was 19 years old as an adult, I just didn't do it as much as an adult. Um, 
you know, that, that really helped me. And, uh, you know, I think it was, I think it was last May, um, you know, when, you know, the pandemic hit and, you know, there was a big movement, you know, for Asians and, you know, the, the BLM movement. Then uh, I posted for, for the first time these photos of me as a kid that uh, I thought, like, I kept them because I liked them. I thought they were cool. Uh, I dressed up as a cowboy. I had the most horrific looking cowboy outfit. I had these, you know, terrible, um, uh, I, I, I probably should pull it up, um, these knee patches and this pleather plastic cowboy vest. And, like, I was always embarrassed of it. Right. And um, I never posted that picture until like last year. And, and, you know, I made a statement about, you know, how, uh, you know, okay, if you're going to, if you're going to attack Asians and, and, and other people, right. Because of the way they look or because of their background or because of their heritage, then, you know, you know, you're welcome to pick on me uh, because I don't really care. Um, But, but it was me about owning, owning myself and owning that part of me that was, you know, that was hidden away that I never wanted anybody to see because, you know, when you do develop a name for yourself and you win titles and you don't want people to see your insecurities until you realize that's probably one of the most helpful ways, you know, to engage and interact with people is to allow them to see your faults and your flaws and your weaknesses. So that way you are more human to them and they can connect with you on some level. So that way they'll actually listen to you versus you know, trying to be up on this pedestal, you know, acting all high and mighty that you're perfect when we're not, we're not at all. We all have our, uh, our faults and, you know, weaknesses, and it's okay to share those once in a while. Well, I, I certainly appreciate you being vulnerable with us because uh, a, a lot of people are, like you said, are afraid of showing that insecurity as as someone that's again high profile as instructors in our schools we want them to see us in a certain light when in reality the more they get to know the person than just the title i think that the the relationship really starts to begin from there so thank you for sharing all of that with us and and as we get ready to close the show i mean 53 I minutes have, went hang on i have the, really I have the photo Come, look at this let me see if it'll show can you see that? Yes, yes. That's it. You see those? You see those? Um, oh, it went. Hang on. It just went dark. Yeah. See those Payless? Uh, those are probably uh, five dollar shoes. And <laughs> those knee patches and that. Oh, and that hat though. Look at that hat, man. I mean, you got nothing on that hat, Master. <laughs> you got nothing on that hat. You I don't know. I might. <laughs> I might have to find some pictures. I, I can remember as a kid, I, I thought Star Wars was super cool. So I got a pair of boots. They were cowboy boots, but I wanted to be Han Solo. And I tucked my pants into my boots. And, and I thought that was like the coolest thing. And I went to school and someone told me only girls tuck their boot, their pants inside their boots. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, we all, we all have some stuff, right? And, and yeah. again, thank you so much for sharing with us today and, and spending time with me. Um, I know a lot of people will see this later. Um, you know, you've been someone, like I said in the beginning, that throughout my years as a consultant and coming up in the martial arts, you know, I always really looked up to you and and always aspired to speak like you. You know, you were one of the people that when I got up to speak on the stage at the Super Show, I wanted to have the mic chat aura, you know, and I we talked about that. You just have this engaging yet intense in a good way, just way of bringing everybody into you. I mean, people really do lean in and, and listen. And thank you for, for, you know, thank you for having my, my son, my kids come into your school and, and, and just continuing our relationship. I, I really do appreciate it. And this is why I'm doing these videos is because I want to take some time to let all the people in my life that have inspired me, motivated me, um, just challenged me in certain ways. I just want everybody to get to know those people and, and recognize you for that. So once again, thank you so much. Lots of respect yeah. to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, if you could in the next 30 to 60 seconds, Speak to everybody watching and we'll watch later on our YouTube channel, Facebook Live, wherever. 
and just motivate them from a moment of where they may be in their deepest, darkest struggle and what they need to do to pull themselves out. Uh, all right, set the timer. So here's what I have to say. Now more than ever with the pandemic and everything going on, uh, it, it's been the, one of the toughest times in, in our history as human beings to then deal with circumstances. Uh, you matter. People care. There are people that love you. Mental health is number one. It's not a thing of the moment. It, it has been a thing. Um, and it should be a focus. Um, connect with people. When you feel isolated, when you feel alone, when you feel you can't do it or there's no one around to help, there are always people. Connect with people because other people need connection as well. Once you start connecting, then you will realize that there's other people that are sharing the same thoughts, the same stories, the same struggles. And from there, you can really build. If you're on another level where, where you're trying to go to the next level, right? Then, then it's all about expanding your brand, building your network, but you know, make sure you're working with mentors. Um, you know, the more you give, the more you get back. So it's kind of, you know, it's kind of twofold. So, you know, at the same time that you're trying to gain ground and move ahead, then just make sure that you're, you're out there giving and, and in that way you can never go wrong, right? Do the right thing. You can never go wrong. Uh, everything is uncomfortable until it becomes comfortable. Um, you know, it's just, you just have to be willing to go through that struggle and be uncomfortable. Um, one of my favorite quotes um, is, uh, and I, I guess I'll, I'll close it with this, um, never stop learning because life never stops giving. And as long as, as, long as you focus on, on that, right? Everybody was a nobody until they became a somebody, but you know, there's no shortcuts in terms of the work and, and the hours, um, but it's much more, fr uh, much, much more fun when you have friends and, and you have fun along the way. So just, just do it with other people. Don't be alone out there. Don't stay isolated. Connect. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. And, and I want to share this with you. Uh, one of our viewers says, uh, thank you. Thank you for opening up to some of those past things growing up Asian uh, that we don't all want to talk about. Being Filipino, I was called slurs and, uh, of all kinds of different backgrounds. So thank you, Brett. Uh, Brent for sharing that. Yeah. And uh, again, Mr. Chat, thank you so much. Uh, hang around for a minute. I'm going to make a couple quick announcements and uh, close it out with our video. But I've got some amazing guests coming up throughout all of 2021. And I've been so blessed with the response and, and you know, everybody wanting to be involved in this project that I, I believe that this will continue throughout 2022 with the, the number of people that have uh, just gracefully accepted this challenge, if you will. So coming up um, next week, we have Frank Silverman will be our, our next guest on the show. Um, a good friend of mine, Nick Kennedy, uh, Dane Evans, who is uh, viewing today, Karen Eden and Chris Casamasa will close out April with Dave Kovar. Nice. I'm excited to present these uh, throughout the rest of this year. And uh, this will be up on our YouTube channel a little bit later tonight, guys. So, so share it. A lot of great information from Mr. Chat. Once again, sir, thank you so much. Really appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And, and to all the listeners, uh, please reach out. Make sure you're following Master Flame and um, share because you know this is what we do as instructors and school owners. It, it, it's, we're here for you and the community. Uh, I love that you're doing this, Master Flame. It really is important because a lot of the people that you have on your roster, it's hard to get them. And, and because of your position in the industry, you just pick up the phone and you know, of course, of course, they're going to want to do an interview with you. So, you know, it's valuable. You know, you, you, you can't, you can't get this kind of time with people that you, that you just listed, especially like, you know, Mr. Silverman, like you, you, you can't go take him out to lunch and get, get a half an hour of his time. You just can't, but you can through your, through, through your broadcast. And, and so, you know, don't underestimate that. Listen to what these people have to say and, uh, you know, you'll be better for it. So th thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's definitely my pleasure and good catching up a little bit. Uh, we'll have to catch up a, a little more in person if we can soon. Yeah, for sure. All right, guys. Well, that's it for today's Master Motivation. Uh, please, again, share this video with anybody that may be interested in watching and getting a little extra boost of that motivation for today on Monday. And uh, we'll close it out. I'll see you guys next week at noon right here at Master Jason Flame on Facebook. Take care, guys. Thank you.